Welcome to the Music Ed Matters podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Emily Williams Birch, and this podcast, it exists for you. Whether you're a music lover, an educator, a choir member, each week we bring guests to the show to help explore what matters in music. I'm so glad that you're here. Welcome to the show. And welcome to the Music Again Matters podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Emmy Birch. And today we are talking to my friend, Carrie Fergus. Carrie is so fun to talk to. And in this episode, we look at how you can approach score study no matter where you are in your music reading journey. I love when Carrie said that she just wants to make music accessible. She never wants music to feel inaccessible. Instead, view looking at the score as a treasure trove of gemstones to uncover. In this conversation, we talk about how Carrie got into music theater specifically and how we can use various elements of music to enhance your interpretation of what you're hearing. Now, if you're not a musical theater person, that's totally fine because everything Carrie says is applicable to whatever your musical thing is, whether you're a music listener or you're a choir person or you're a solo singer in a different way or you're whatever fill in the blank. We talk about how to analyze melody, rhythm, harmony, motives, form, even interpretation. Y'all hang on to the very end because Carrie's take on interpretation is the bomb. But that's enough of me talking. Don't forget, you can follow us over at Music Ed Matters on Instagram. You can support the show at patreon.com slash music matters. You can like and review. And this episode is brought to you by our friends at Perform International. Stay tuned because in a couple of weeks, we are going live on choir tour. Whoop, whoop. All right, that's enough. Let's talk about how we can unpack and uncover all of the gems in the treasure trove that is a score. Today on the Music Ed Matters podcast, we are talking to my friend, Carrie Fergus. Hi, Carrie. Hi. It's good to I'm, be here. I'm so excited we get this one-on-one time. Y'all, Carrie is one of the best singers you've ever heard. I'm going to toot her horn for her. You <laughs> sounded so good on your solo Sunday. Thank you. Oh my goodness. Like gorgeous voice, y'all. But Carrie is new to our church choir in Savannah. We're so excited about her husband. We'll have to get George on the podcast eventually. But Carrie, tell us, how did you get into music? I think music has always been a part of my life. I grew up in a very musical family. Um, grew up singing in churches and in choirs at school and doing theater and um I ended up going to school for a music degree in college. So I, I have a bachelor's of music in vocal performance, which is actually where I met my husband, who was my accompanist in college. That's the cutest story ever. <laughs> so I always recommend to singers that you marry your accompanist because, you know, it's so convenient. <laughs> accompanist for life. Anyway. Um, and then I went on from, from undergrad to get a degree in acting. So I have, a, a an MFA in performing arts from the Savannah College of Art and Design. Um, cause I have always loved music and I had a more of a classical training in my, um, undergraduate degree, but I love musical theater and that's really always been my, um, you know, the, the ultimate, uh, dream for me. You know, I love musical theater. And so I, I needed more acting um, basis, you know, in my education. So I, I went on to get that acting degree for my MFA. And now, of course, I don't do any actual music theater <laughs> acting anymore. But, um, you know, I, it's totally worth it still. I, I, I value the uh, all the lessons I learned in both, both undergrad and graduate school. Y'all were at St. Olaf for undergrad. Yes, St. Olaf College. How did you end up, because you're from Savannah, question mark? Yes. <laughs> How did you end up way up there? Well, my sister went to St. Olaf, um, but I don't really know how she heard about St. Saint- Olaf. I mean, it's a very small school, but it's got a really stellar, particularly choral program. Um, the St. Olaf Choir in, in particular, you know, tours all over the place. And um, the St. Olaf Orchestra is also, you know, very well known and, and very respected Um, so it just, it has, it's, it's kind of like a conservatory type music education, but within a liberal arts college in the Midwest. Um, so it's the small little Lutheran Midwestern college. Um, what is that? Like 3000 students or something very small. Um, but, uh, the music 
program there is 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 top notch. Did you do music? At, you were a Country Day grad, is that right? A Savannah Country yes. Day grad. I went to Savannah Country Day. I sang in the choir there. I did theater there while while I was in high school. Um, yeah, but I was I was very involved in the choir there in the in the days of Maya Roos. If any Savannians mm-hmm. are listening. I think Maya she was here is a, I first got here. a, she a was, personality in Savannah. Yes, y'all, she would show up to conduct her concerts. I went to every one of y'all's concerts while she was there with these massive gowns. <laughs> she wore gowns to conduct. She has a lot of flair. Yes. It was awesome. It's a cool tradition to see how these different areas of Savannah cultivate. They still have great plays and great musicals at Savannah Country Day. Mm -hmm. And that's still a big piece of what they provide to Savannah. And it makes sense if you got the classical training for undergrad and you wanted to do music theater, how you ended up at SCAD, which selfishly, I'm so excited to talk about that since I am brand new faculty at SCAD. And that is so cool. So how did you see your classical training tie over into your MFA with acting as the focus? You know, it was an interesting transition to be sure, um, because my I was getting a music degree and everything was about singing, right? And I was in, you know, operas and I was in musical theater productions in college, but it was always about the the voice. You know, it was all about training the voice and very little um emphasis given to acting. And then I switched over to SCAD, which um you know, I ended up at SCAD mostly because I, I have a connection there and could get a free SCAD education. <laughs> so my dad Whoa, is that's SCAD. Huge. And that's one of those perks of uh, professors can have their children go to school for free. So that's the main motivation that I had for for going to, to SCAD for um graduate degree, which, you know, you can't discount the uh no, you can't the value of a free graduate no. degree. Uh, <laughs> but it was it was such a different world because you come to SCAD and SCAD was is has always been more focused on um, obviously acting. They have musical theater um, there, but it's very much more of an acting program, and specifically even acting for film and, and television. So acting for the stage really takes a a, a lesser priority at SCAD. Um, so it was you know it was being thrown into a completely different world. I wow. felt like I had you know I was in an, a master's degree program, and yet I felt like I was you know totally over my head. You know, it was one of those things where it was like, okay, you're going to sink or swim, you know, and you have to just jump in. Yeah, and, jump in but yeah just feet. going straight into an acting program. But it was wonderful. I also love, you know, theater and I read so many wonderful plays and, you know, all of, you know, worked on Shakespeare and things like that when I was getting my master's degree. And and that's always, you know, a pleasure to to work with with theater. Right. I just went to the graduating showcase. So all the seniors Mm. and graduate students who are graduating in June. And I had no idea what showcase was. And I was walking out of the building and the dean and department chair offered me, they're like, are you coming to showcase? I'm like, I'll be there. Anything you want me to be, I will be there. And it was me sitting there surrounded by all of these casting directors from LA and New York and Chicago. And the singers were so incredible. And the variety and and depth of their performance. It was definitely not all music theater. And there mm-hmm. was some classical stuff thrown in there. Um, my personal favorite was a rock guitar version by a tenor voice singing Hit Me Baby One More Time by Britney Spears. <laughs> Very well, I must add. Every single millennial in the room was rocking out to that one. That's awesome. I love it was that. so cool. But I love the variety. So you knew you loved musical theater. What shows have you been in? Oh, okay. Um, probably the, some of my favorite things that I have been in. I um, I once had, had the opportunity to play Kunigunda and Candide, which, um, you know, with with my classical baseline to to my voice training, you know, Kunigunda is really more of an operatic part. That's um, a challenging one to sing, and and so it's it's so so much fun. It's mm-hmm. such a score to sing and and candide is a is very flawed uh play in terms of, of 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 how it's actually structured no one can ever make candide work but people always keep trying and trying and trying because bernstein's score is amazing it's mm. just an incredible um score for the theater and and yet the the the, the book itself doesn't work very well. but it's still it's such a pleasure to sing 
Um, and I always love Sondheim. I, Sondheim is, you know, one of the absolute greats and I, I, I adore Sondheim. So being in productions, I've been in, I guess I've been involved in three productions of Into the Woods <laughs> in my life, but um, I, I at one point got to the chance to play the baker's wife, which was um, an all time favorite for me. I love, oh, cool. I love that role. I love that show. It's, it's, it's such a great one. It's fun to see you glow talking about all of this because we sit across from each other in choir. So I get to <laughs> hear your voice and I get to see you sing. And it's very lovely to be on the other side and hear it and be a part of it. But to see you glow talking about this is really exciting. So George has spoiled it and told me that you did this really cool lecture on something related to musical theater. And he said, I would really enjoy talking to you about it. So <laughs> tell us, what is this, this topic that you're excited about? Yes. So I, my area of expertise, so I have sort of shifted my career at this point. I no longer audition for theater. Um, I no longer really interested in a, a performance career, but what I am very much interested in is scholarship, um, and, and academia. I, I run a blog actually, or I haven't written any new, uh, content for it in a few years, which is what happens when you have a toddler. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's kind of time consuming. <laughs> in and of itself. I think if you look at when, when the writing sort of drops off on my blog, look, it's right around the time that my son was born. Um, so that's unfortunate, but I do have quite a lot of content that's still up there and the blog is, is still running. Um, but it's called from score to stage. And the entire purpose of this is to teach uh, musical theater artists about score study. Uh, because this is one of the things that I learned in my time actually at SCAD. I was really intrigued by the fact that so many of my peers in that program had no music education um, and really no music education. Some of them, you know, were aspiring musical theater singers and they couldn't read music, which, um, you know, not to knock on anyone who doesn't read music, like you certainly can <laughs> be a musical theater performer without learning how to read music. It's an uphill climb, you know, you have to work that much harder. But I do think that it's important for a musical theater artist to learn as much as they can about the music and about the score. And there's so many gems that a composer, it's almost like a little treasure hunt, right? A composer leaves little clues for you in a score. Uh, and I and if you don't have the tools to be able to learn what you're listening to, to be able to delve into the score, then your performance and your understanding of your character and your role in the show is just going to be that much less layered, right? That there's so much richness that can be brought out by understanding the score. And so that's what the blog is intended to do. It's intended to give yeah. people who perhaps have a pretty low level of musical literacy a, a door into this, a, a way to look at, well, what am I looking for in a score? What, where should I start? Um, and on top of running the blog, I then I have taken this lecture to a, a number of different um, academic environments. So I've given it in for undergrad students and and high schoolers, actually. And I also, I think, yeah, at one point I gave it to uh, some grad students as well. So sort of a range of um, places, but essentially... I have a, a, a set lecture that I give that's usually a, let's introduce you to what you're looking for in a mm -hmm. score when you're first sitting down and perhaps don't have too much knowledge of what what can be found in a, in a score. That's so important. And it, it's so perfectly relevant right now because I think as educators, we are looking for ways to diversify our teaching. Like you said, it's you don't have to be a literate musician to be a great musician but we need to celebrate all the different ways of learning and being able to score study is one of those ways. But I like, like an added about, bonus. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's finding those gems. I like that idea of it being a treasure hunt. So we've spent a lot of time in class right now, just getting acquainted with what are we seeing and how do we hear that in our head before we open our mouths? Lots of sight singing. Um, teaching sight singing classes, like my favorite two and a half hours <laughs> of the day. So much fun. 
So oh, I, 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 I always hated sight singing, but maybe it's more fun to You'll teach. You'll have to come <laughs> hang out sometime and come sing with us. We have a blast. We, so we solfege and we play all these different solfege games. And then we do sight reading, um, like one-offs and kind of get in competitions. And then we apply it to so much music. It's kind of like a sight reading choir in a way. That's it's a fun. lot of fun. I, that does sound a like a lot. You would rock at that because your sight reading skills are the bomb. Well, thank you. I, I'm glad that I can fake it well enough because I, I always feel like my sight reading is, is, is a little rocky. No, you are totally, totally rocking it. Okay. So let's pretend we're sitting down and we're talking or someone listening is thinking, how can I introduce or get someone excited about studying the score? What are the steps? How do we do this? Okay. So I would say there's sort of uh, some headlines, right? There are a bunch of different areas that you're going to want to be looking at. So some of them are are the most basic, you know, we're looking at let's take a look at the melody first of all, you know, what is what is the tune of this thing doing? Um that's probably one of the most basic ways that you can look at a score. Um you know, so if if the you, you're looking and you're asking yourself is the line of this melody mostly moving upwards? Is it mostly moving down? And even looking at a staff even if you don't know how to read the notes, if you don't know, you know, oh, this line is an E or whatever. You should still be able to tell the general ups and downs of this melody, right? And also looking at how big are the intervals. So the distance between two notes. Are things mostly moving stepwise? So they're moving in very small intervals, or do they have big giant leaps? And all of these things are going to be little hints into character. And some of them are even so self-explanatory that I bet you could guess, even if you're not a musically literate person, if the melody is moving mostly down, 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 emotionally, what might that mean for the character? Oh, yeah. That that probably means that they're maybe depressed or, you know, they're they're angry or, you know, like that, that motion down, we instinctively know that that's like, oh, something is is happening emotionally here, whereas moving up is going to be probably, oh, this person is excited or they're happy or they're, you know, they're filled with love. Um, the smaller intervals versus the bigger intervals, it's going to be sort of the same thing. You can probably instinctually um, feel that. One of, one, a good example of this um, would be if you know the song On the Street Where You Live from mm-hmm. Uh, My Fair Lady, Lerner and Lowe, classic musical theater piece. And this is a love song. You know, this character has just met this woman. He is standing outside of her home, just waxing poetically about how wonderful it is just to be in the vicinity. Right? <laughs> so he's he's like the, the absolute most romantic person of all time. Anyway, so he sings on the street where you live and you look at the intervals and I'm sorry, excuse me, because I'm going to sing a little bit just to like yeah, give an example do. of what I'm doing. So it is is by no means, you know, go listen to a professional recording if you're listening to this, but just to illustrate what I'm talking about. Um, he goes, I have often walked and that's a perfect fourth, I think, down the street before, but the pavement, perfect Fifth, always stay beneath my feet before. All at once, semi, major seventh, several stories high. Right? So it just keeps getting bigger and bigger. And it's such a beautiful illustration of what he's feeling, right? We go from the fourth to the fifth to the seventh. And even the last time you hear that, um, the very last part of the piece, you guys, all I want, let, let, let the time go by. Oh, I won't care if I write. So it takes it all the way up to the octave, the yeah. last, right? It's always stretching. It's always building. And you can even see that on the paper, right? So even if you don't read music, you see those gaps and you see that they're getting bigger and they're getting bigger as he goes. And I love this buildup of the of the intervals in this line of the main melody, because it's such a beautiful little illustration of what he's feeling. And I always interpret it as he's so overwhelmed by these emotions, right, that they're like almost bursting out of him, right? The intervals can't help but get bigger because he's just bursting with feeling. Man, which is a lot of fun. To life in a whole different perspective, because the mm-hmm. words already do that. And what the character the the personality of the character so often, but I've never thought about it in the, you know, push up your glasses, nerdy terms of <laughs> yeah. the intervals, but you're right. It's the intervals bursting forth and getting bigger and bigger and mm-hmm. bigger. 
Okay. Super cool. So the first thing we look at is melody and what can it tell us, whether melodic direction or is it conjunct or disjunct, how big are the spaces between the notes and what does that tell us about the And another good question would be, have we seen this melody before, you know, and that's something that you can just orally pick up on, right? Even without reading the music, you can maybe listen and go, oh, I've heard that. Where did I hear that in this score? You know, there, there are so many scores, you know, Hamilton, for instance, Hamilton Mm -hmm. is built constantly on these these um melodies that you heard before or these rhythms you know if it's if it's a more of like a, a hip-hop moment that that there's constantly building on these things throughout the show so you get to the end of the show and a song like oh, what, what what is what's towards the end but the things at the end of the show have like a thousand oh, yeah. different references in them. all the different little and it's a great way to build in the history right because it's like how many years of his life in the course of you know three hours in the theater and you're getting this sense of the history because of that callback of like oh yeah oh yeah i hear that that's part of him that's part of her you know like you're you're hearing where these things come come from um and sometimes they can be a little bit hidden though um one of my favorite examples to give someone to show that like a composer does sometimes leave little clues in the score um and this is a melody thing again um you you, you can talk about my not my fair lady um Sorry, The Music Man. Mm. Uh, and if you listen to The Music Man, the first song that Marion sings, other than the little thing that she sings with her mom, um, her first solo song is Good Night, My Someone. And then the next piece in the show is Harold's big signature number, which is 76 trombones. And they sound very different. Um, they're, you know, one is very smooth and sweet and legato. It's the soprano lovely thing. And the other is very bombastic and brass and... Um, they're the same song, which is such a funny thing. You know, you listen to good night, my someone, good night, my love, 76 trombones led oh my the gosh. parade. Shattering. Right? Mm. And it's such a fun little thing. People always, their brains get shattered when you point this out to them. And it's not just like that beginning phrase. It's actually the entire song. They're just the same song, um, which is like, Okay, Meredith Wilson, the composer, isn't just being lazy, right? Like, if he were be- being lazy, like, you know, he wrote this gorgeous score. It's not like he's like, oh, no one will notice. I'll just put the same thing in. No, he did it for a reason, right? Like, right. He, he did this to tell us something about the characters. And how I have always interpreted this is that he's giving us some information. He's telling us that these two characters who on paper seem to be opposites, You know, they're so different in character, but he's telling us that at at heart, they're actually very similar, right? Because they sing the same music. They they sing the same melodies. Um, And so I think that if I were then in that show, I never had the chance to be in the music man. I I love that score. Um, Such a beautiful show. But I would be working then to bring out those similarities. You know, what do Marion and Harold have in common? They're both outsiders. They both yearn for like a bigger world than than this small town that they're in, you know, all these things that you can draw out and you're prompted to do that because you took a look at the melody and you heard those similarities and you realize what Meredith Wilson had done. I mean, Carrie, you've just given us a plethora <laughs> of things to think about. And it's not just for music theater world too. I mean, this all applies to choir world or band world, looking at the tunes, the melodies, but you've done such a great job just in this first, what are we looking for? This first gem, the first clue we're getting emotion. We're getting personality. We're getting character traits. We're getting plot forward and backwards and all sorts of things all from just looking at the shape of the melody. Yeah. And there's, and you know, that's what I'm saying that, like, I tell people that the the score is such just a treasure trove, right? There's so much, like, beauty to be found in a musical theater score um, if you just take the time to, you know, spend some time with it. I love, um, if I'm, back in the days when I used to actually do a lot more theater, I would always sit down with the score in front of me and listen to however many cast recordings I could find and just be like taking notes, you know, like, Oh, what is that little thing that I just heard? And some of my notes, I, you know, they go nowhere. It's like, Oh, I don't think that that was actually a thing or, you know, that, that, Oh, I thought that that was similar to that melody, but actually it's not, but just taking the time to really just write down everything that you're hearing, everything that you're feeling as you look at the score and listen to it, I think is such a, a wonderful way to approach the study of a role. 
So looking and listening. I mean, we do that with choral music all the time. Like you like this example and not that example. I mean, George is still new. So I still, every time he assigns me something, I'm like, what's your favorite recording of this? So I can give that a listen. Cause it might not be the same as my favorite recording. Although mm-hmm. it's almost always the same as my favorite recording. <laughs> So that's a really good fit. But that's interesting because I bet if music reading is not your go-to thing, the idea of listening while also looking is a skill in and of itself. Yeah. But it also will help you to get more familiar with reading a score. You know, if you're following along, you're going to get more comfortable reading a staff and learning how to read music. So it's something that I I encourage if someone is looking to get more into score study. Definitely. Okay. What do we look at after we've looked at the melody or the tune? Oh, okay. Let's talk about rhythm. (laughs) Got rhythm. rhythm? Yes. Um, Dear Gershwin. So rhythm is another one that I think it almost comes intuitively when you start listening um, to the rhythms of a piece and like what they can tell you about a character, right? So you know, dotted rhythms versus straight rhythms, syncopation versus you know, something that's that's smoother. You listen to these things and you do get kind of a sense for I mean, sorry, I'm 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 not I'm not saying this well enough, but you You're listen to these things. It, which makes it even I know, I'm, I'm very passionate. Um no, you listen to the rhythms and I think that these traditions that have built up, not just in musical theater, but in classical music as well, in opera, um, they're kind of intuitive, right? So a, a character who speaks, whose rhythm goes by very, very, very quickly, and it's almost like a patter song, that character is going to be perhaps very agitated or very excitable, or they have a very quick wit, or they're very intelligent. If someone is singing and it's very smooth and, and the rhythms are, you know, very even, then perhaps they have an even temperament, you know, these things it's it's not necessarily rocket science. You don't have to be scared to look at the rhythms and be like, I have no idea what it means. You know, sometimes you can just feel it out and you get a sense for how the rhythm can tell you about character. An example that I like to give um, in, in Rodgers and Hammerstein's Carousel, um, there are there are two, two characters, two women who are introduced in the first scene, um, Carrie and Julie. And uh, they're having a discussion. They're, they're both mill workers uh, and they are not supposed to be out right now. They're, they're, so they have a curfew. They're supposed to be back at, at their job at the mill. And um, they're having this discussion. And Carrie and Julie sing the same melodies in their discussion, but they use different rhythms. And so Carrie goes, you are quieter and deeper than a well. Right. It's very even. It's just. Eighth, 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 eighth note. You are quieter and deeper than oh well. And then Carrie, I mean, Julie goes, there's nothing that I care to choose to tell. So Julie swings the whole thing, right? She she has these dotted rhythms. They're not right. Um, and it's very different, right? <laughs> Even though um they they're singing the same tune, the rhythm gives it a different character. And so it's not necessarily surprising then when later in the scene, when they get caught by their boss, Carrie of the straight rhythms is like, oh, I'm not going to lose my job. I'm going to go straight home. Like, I'm not going to break the rules. And Julie, who has the lovely dotted rhythms, decides she's going to break the rules and she's going to stay out with this man who she should not be with. And you know, kiss him. And, you know, she sends her life on this whole t- new trajectory because um, she's this rule breaker, you know, looser kind of character. But it's it's interesting to see the, the dichotomy between these two women, right? Just purely based on how their rhythms are written in the score. Okay. So that just, I mean, I'm, I'm still, you said Hamilton. And so that got me <laughs> down that pathway. I'm thinking about the scene where all of the, they're introducing all of the characters that are Mm -hmm. hanging out with Hamilton and you're getting to know where they're going and what their roles are about to be in Mm -hmm. the upcoming war. And they all have those different rhythms that they're playing on the picnic bench or whatever they're sitting on together, drinking the drink. And it's so cool. But I'm also thinking that same musical, how the the Schuller sisters, all three sisters have different motives within that right. song yes oh, i haven't thought about it like that <laughs> gonna, and I'm those motives come musical tonight 
Yeah. <laughs> Go watch Hamilton, you know, yeah. oh, shucks. got musicals on the brain. Um, yeah, those motives are constantly coming back. If you have to show anytime Eliza comes on stage, it's like, Eliza, right? Like mm-hmm. we have to identify her by her musical motive, <laughs> you know, or I'm Alexander Hamilton, you know, like every single time, like, you know. Right. But those rhythms in there, because that Eliza has that long held and mm-hmm. Alexander Hamilton is all broken. Da, da, ka, ba, da, yeah. ka, ba. It makes sense what that rhythm is telling you. And it's definitely a show that is all about the rhythm (laughs) Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and all about, I mean, I'm, we're sort of getting sidetracked, but one of the things I love about Hamilton is that um, obviously there's a lot of different musical styles that are used in that show, but the essentially the more modern musical styles are reserved for like the cooler characters, like Lafayette and, and and Hamilton or whatever. And these like, like, you'll be back. (laughs) Exactly. You'll be back. is like, the the 1960s um the where, where the the yes. the Beatles you know like these 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 bo- in, invasion boy bands from the yes. from Britain like it's in that style so it's like this buddy daddy like old style and the same with Jefferson when Jefferson oh, yes. comes in it's all um you know like rhythm and blues it's not to say there's anything against rhythm and blues or anything but it's very different you know like all the 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 bad characters they don't get to sing like the cool music <laughs> they have to sing like that about old that fashioned either. music oh my gosh that's okay so let's go back so you're talking rhythm and we were talking about carousel because there's also rhythmic things to find in carousel which is also a great musical beautiful musical it's i mean it's it's flawed in the second act you know a lot of people have issue take issue with the book there and the um domestic abuse <laughs> appears yeah, that. in that show you know we're just gonna gloss over that it's a beautiful mm-hmm. score it is that's the thing the music is beautiful how can we like the reinterpretation of that is something for the directors to manage that's we right you're just yeah. talking about the scores that's right what if rogers and hammerstein <laughs> right into this they did actually have a really I, I got a chance to see the most recent revival of carousel on broadway a few years ago um, and they they handled it pretty well at the end. He didn't actually slap Louise. Um, and I believe they took out the line about a slap can feel like a kiss, which is oh awful. God. Yeah, that's that's in the original. I think they, they excised that from the new version. Good call. Um, good call. Yeah. I love Carousel. It, I think it's it's a beautiful score, but it's it's difficult when the ending is so flawed. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I saw um, Porgy and Bess live in HD from the Met. This would maybe two years ago, and it was so beautifully performed, just absolutely stunning in just every aspect of it. I didn't even have time to analyze the music. I was so enraptured with the actual, you felt like you were there. Mm. It was beautifully done. Now I've gotten a sidetracked. Okay. We've talked (laughs) about the tone. We've talked about the tune. We've talked about rhythm and what that can tell us. I have some students who have kind of gotten confused about syncopation and not syncopation. And I always say that syncopation, you have to feel a beat and then it happens after syncopation is something that almost makes you move and then you make sound. How do you describe syncopation to non- music readers or well, that's, beginning a, that's music a good readers. question i think i would say that syncopation is essentially singing on those off beats right that it's something that is even is you know you're, you're always going to have a metronome going essentially in a piece and like here's our even beat dot 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 but if you're syncopation is when you're sort of off those beats you're doing you have a triple it or you know triple it you know like um yeah so so you sort of I like your your definition of you sort of feel that syncopation. You'll find more syncopation in jazz than you would in, you know, classical repertoire. Okay, so we've talked about tune and rhythm. We clarified some syncopation. What's next on our treasure trove hunt? Well, you know, you mentioned motives in Hamilton. So let's talk about motives because mm-hmm. motives then would be like a smaller subset of the melody, right? The melody, we're talking about the entire tune. A motive is just that small little musical idea. It can just be even a couple of notes, um, but something small. So Eliza, that's a motive, you know, in Hamilton. It's That show is full of them. Mm-hmm. Um Another show that I love to talk about when you talk about motives uh, would be Into the Woods. Um, Love Into the Woods. Um, And I, uh, my personal analysis of Into the Woods, I I believe that that is a show that's really just built on three motives. Um, There are 
three musical ideas that are really important in Into the Woods. Um, and the first one, it's just two notes, right? It's just, I wish, it's the first thing you hear in the entire show, right? I wish, it's everywhere. Um, and then you have the beans, which is my personal favorite motive. I love the beans. Um, this bean motive, and this is something that a lot of um, uh, academics will refer to this motive as the bean motive because it uh, first appears, well, it doesn't first appear, but it very significantly appears when the baker is trading Jack for the cow with the beans and he hands him these beans. He goes, bum, 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 bum. He puts five beans in his hands and there are five notes that play while he's putting the beans in his hands. So this is the bean motive and it pops up everywhere in the show. But it's super fun to trace it through the show because at first it kind of is restricted to the people who have direct contact with the beans. So like Jack, for instance. And then it just gets more and more saturated as the show goes on because the beans sort of determine the outcome of the entire show, right? Like they're really just like, it sort of filters through and gets, and they've touched everyone's lives by the end. But Jack is really associated with them. So if you know the song Giants in the Sky, which is Jack's song that he sings, Mm -hmm. he goes, there are giants in the sky. Bum, 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 bum. That's the beans. And the whole song is beans. When you're way up high and you look below, bum, 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 bum. You know, (laughs) the entire song is just beans, 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 beans. And uh, Rapunzel, too. I love the Rapunzel connection because Rapunzel only ever sings one thing in the show other than you know end of act choruses that every character sings uh rapunzel sings her lovely little "Ah, ah, 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 ah." well what is that that's bum 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 that's the beans again um and that one's a little bit more interesting to me because rapunzel never touches the beans she never encounters them in the show but if you remember Rapunzel is the original trait for the beans, right? That like when the beans were stolen, she's what's given to the witch in return. So her entire uh, life it's has based on the been, beans. yeah, her entire life is, is, has been, the course of her life has been altered by these beans, right? And so she's so trapped in her own little world because of what has happened to her and because of beans that literally that's the only musical language that she has, that all she's capable of singing is this little bean motive over and over and over again. I'm going to have to watch that again now too. Thank you. Yeah, I have to watch Watch Into the Woods. I love the um, the, the original cast recording that they they did. And I... Is it 1990 that they? It was a few years after it originally came out, right? That they right, recorded it. Was an it. 80s one. Yeah. It is, it's so interesting because I I teach a class on film score, and that was part of my doctoral minor because I love how film scores can change the character as they go along. Mm. Gone with the Wind is one of the first ones. The motive and the tune develops as the character develops, and spoiler in the end, the house tune becomes Scarlet's tune because Mm -hmm. she was without a tune until she found that the house was her home. Oh, I love that. But that type of thing. But what you're talking about is all about putting that into your persona onto the stage, but you discover it because your face is in the score looking at the music while your ears are listening. Mm -hmm. That's so important. Yeah, for sure. So how does a new reader or how does someone who's starting to really score study, how do they know that it's emotive? Oh, that's a good question. I would say <laughs> if you're hearing it enough, it's emotive, right? Like it's it's all about repetition, you know? So you can't just take any particular, you know, three note, five note um, little passage and be like, this is a new motive. But if, you know, you're looking at Giants in the Sky, for instance, and let's say you haven't looked at the rest of the score yet, you're just looking at Giants in the Sky, you're going to notice eventually that most of the song is following that same pattern. Bum, 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 bum. So you can identify it there, right? That like it's happening so often, right? And it's returning at such significant moments that I think you can properly qualify it as a motive. And some people like the term 
light motive instead. Um, you know, that that's a very Wagnerian. Wagnerian. And if, um, if you term. don't know Wagner and all of the, the <laughs> ring cycle, how, weren't there like hundreds of little motives for oh, everything? Oh, yes. The whole ring cycle. It's like, this is for this character and this is the motive for this character. And then you find them layered on top of each other. And it, that's like Wagner's whole deal. Um, but like even... I do. I, I I never want musical theater or just music in general to feel inaccessible because sometimes like you're talking about motives or light motives or whatever. You're like, I can't identify that. But I bet that you can. And I feel like one of the places that you can go to sort of assure yourself actually would be look at a John Williams score, like watch Star Wars, you know, just go watch A New Hope. And it's full of motives, right? Like Luke Skywalker has his own music and like Leia has her own music and Darth Vader, bum, 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 ba -dum, bum, ba -dum. you know? And like, if I sing that to anyone, A, they're going to be like, oh, that's Star Wars. But B, if I go, okay, what character in Star Wars? They immediately will go, that's Darth Vader. And it's like, yeah, you didn't have to learn that. You didn't have to read it in a book. You just know that that's the Darth Vader music because you heard it enough times. You watch the movie, you know, like every time Darth Vader comes on screen, you hear his Darth Vader, like, jam. Yeah. <laughs> and then, that's and such then a you get, way. I love you know, yeah, so, so every, I think anyone can hear it, right? Like if you, if you listen long enough, you can sort of start to identify those things. I think that's the piece. You have to be willing to listen and listening for these different pieces. You can't just sit down listening to memorize or listening. Like you have to listen for the intention of what is the melody? What direction is it going? What does it look like? How does that impact my character? What's the rhythm? What does it feel like? How does that impact my character? And then mm -hmm. where are those repeating patterns? It's so fun because my fundamentals of songwriting class, we've really been talking about what makes a song a hit because everyone has their own. I mean, it's an art school. So everybody has their own style of music that is their thing. And so you can't just say what's making a pop hit because that doesn't address everyone's favorite music. So now we've started defining what makes a hit within your realm. And the one thing that's unified is repetition. Nice. <laughs> Repetition is a thing. And so they've been trying it in their compositions and that's been so cool to see where they're using it. It's, but yes, repetition is a thing. It builds yeah. legitimacy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right. So tune or melody, rhythm and motives. What else? Gosh, how much time do we have left? There's so many different things you could talk about. Okay. I'm give trying me to figure at least out. one more. Give me okay. one really good one. I mean, then you start getting into some of the deeper things when you start talking about things like harmony or form, you know, like, let's talk about harmony, for instance, you know, for that, if you're talking about harmonies, and I'm talking about like, when you're listening to something, and this is where it gets hard to explain to someone who really has no musical literacy, but you know, a chord is the group of notes that are being played at this moment, right? And the harmony we're talking about, like, where are these chords moving, right? What is the underpinning for the melody that you're singing or, you know, for the rhythms that you're hearing? What, what are we hearing underneath? What are, the, what are these harmonies doing? And for harmony, you really do need to start learning how to read music. <laughs> I, I will say that. That, like, there does come a point where I do encourage everyone, like, maybe, maybe learn how to read a staff. <laughs> just the basics. You can do just the, just basics. the basics. It's okay. But there are interesting things, um, you know, getting into the ideas of, I think that even if you don't have a lot of musical literacy, you can perhaps understand the concept of tonic and dominant, that tonic um, is the, the name that we use, the term that we use to uh, discuss essentially the baseline of, of a musical piece that like, this is home base for this piece, you know, so if we're in the key of C major, a C major chord is the tonic. Right. And um, the dominant is the thing that sort of feeds into the tonic. Right. It's that chord that's like hanging out there and you feel that that movement just wants to go back home to the tonic. And that dominant would be a G major chord in the key of C major. So you get that dominant tonic movement. And in musical theater, you know, musical theater doesn't usually push the bounds of harmonics a lot. Mm -hmm. You know, musical theater is typically pretty standard when it comes yes. to harmonies. Um, but that, you know, so you're going to see that do dominant tonic movement a lot, but sometimes you can hear, even if you're not super familiar with how to read the score, 
when something doesn't land where it's supposed to, particularly at the end of a phrase or at the end of a piece of music, you can kind of sense when something hasn't landed on the tonic. And an, a, a piece that I love to talk about in terms of this would um, is the, the song, Will He Like Me from She Loves Me. Oh. You know, She Loves Me. Yeah. yeah. It's beautiful, beautiful score. And and She Loves Me, um, the song in She Loves Me is, is a moment where the main character, Amalia, is about to go meet a man that she has been corresponding with. And she's fallen in love with him, but she's never met him in real life. And she's about to meet him for the first time. And she is just terrified right and she it's the song is all these questions will he like me when we meet will he like the girl he sees you know will he like me i don't know like she's just so unsure of herself and when you listen to it you might start to pick up on the fact that it never really seems to hit that tonic that you want it to like your ear wants it to hit home and it doesn't because what the composer has done is Anytime there is a question mark in the score, he avoids the tonic like the play. Yes, there is no tonic kids. anytime there's a question mark, no which is everywhere. <laughs> Wait, and I have written down somewhere. Wait, I have um, uh, what the actual ending of this piece is. It's so funny to me. Um, the, the final chord in this piece, because it ends on a question. The final text here is, will he like me? And this piece is in here. It's, it's in F major. And the final chord of the piece is this F major seven chord. So it actually has a seventh on top, which is not. Oh, because it's going to be borrowed. It's a chromatic borrow. And he, he, but the vocal line is on an E. So we're in an F major key and the vocal line is singing an e which is like as dissonant as you can get and then it doesn't even resolve to the f major it has this f major with an added sixth and a ninth on top it's very jazzy sounding it's actually like the five of the four it's a five seven of the four which is just totally gonna push you off the other direction so in a way that's just a yeah, super just deceptive like, cadence. it just hangs there and you can even if you aren't familiar with like how to analyze that like right. oh this is an f major with an added sixth and a ninth you can <sighs> listen to it and it just it hangs like it doesn't it doesn't feel resolved. And in musical terms, it literally does not resolve. Like that's the term that, mu that a music um, hmm. the theorist would use. But did, where does it resolve? It doesn't. It doesn't. There's no resolution. Um, and I love that the vocal line in particular is on that E in an F major piece. You know, like, so it's, you know, that's the next door. Well, mm -hmm. no, which you can probably figure out if you know your alphabet, you know, e and F. E, F, E, right, F. Right next Look to at you other. go. We're making all um, sorts of good connections. Right. So it's just like, it just hangs there and it's beautiful. And it's such a beautiful illustration of what she's feeling, right? Because she feels unsettled and she feels so um, just like unsure. And and the music 100% reflects that. It backs up what she's feeling. And you can hear it, you know, when you're listening that it just, oh, that doesn't go where I think it's going to go. You never get that like solid, like, and now the piece is over, you know, kind of feeling. Mm -hmm. I feel like that's what drew me to musical theater in the first place. I never, ever acted in music theater. Like the acting part of what you talk about, yeah, no thanks. No, <laughs> that's a hard no. But I love that it acts out what the music is, what you're supposed to be feeling through the music. I remember seeing Cats in elementary school and thinking, <laughs> okay, I don't get the plot, but it really goes well with the music. I had no idea what was going on. And then we saw Wicked and that just ties in great. But I know Scad's about to do Pippin at the end of this quarter. Oh, Pippin, that's fun. And I did a huge analysis of Pippin just so I could feel like I knew it before coming on board. Mm -hmm. And one of my favorite songs, Michael Jackson also recorded a cover of it, Morning Glow. Have you ever heard Morning Glow? You know, Pippin's not a score that I'm super familiar with. I know Corner of the Sky, um... Mm -hmm you know, a couple of the like big hits, but I don't actually know that full score. Oh, I think you'd love it. And you'd also do really well in that one. It's good for you. It'd be good for your voice if you were hopping back on a stage. But Morning Glow, I was super drawn to because of the Michael Jackson connection. Because I'm like, how can I connect to this score? I've never seen it. I don't know anything about Pippin. It's a very weird plot point where it's like this alternative universe. And there's the, the, the plot. You'll have to go Google yourself because I do a terrible job of explaining it. But there's all these really cool half cadences where they keep ending on the dominant 
And then suddenly you have this perfect one, four, five, one progression because it's arrived and it's like morning glow, morning glow. And you're just feeling the 1970s vibes. (laughs) It is perfect, but you're all unstable between there. It's alternating like major, minor, major, minor, major, minor, half cadence, and then resolved. And you're just glowing because it's a great harmonic progression. I love those moments where it's just like very, the composer's like put leaving you on the edge and then finally you get that satisfaction. Oh, it's so satisfying. And the choral parts move. There's all these ahs and you're singing ahs and these gorgeous chord progressions. And it's so singable because it's so predictable. It's so much fun. I love the, but I hadn't thought about that either. Okay. We have to hit form super fast. Then we can hit all five. Okay. Okay. There's there's more than that even. Well, you know, there's five text for part one. There. We'll have to just do a part okay. two later. Okay. Um, yeah, so form is another one that's great to look at in terms of like are are the forms predictable or are they not? So a lot of musical theater is gonna be A A B A or like an introduction A A B A. Um, but if something is not predictable, like another predictable form would be like first refrain, first refrain, you know, oh what a beautiful morning is a first refrain song. Um, pretty predictable. It's pretty even, you know, like there's not, there's not a lot of there there, but when you find these forms that are a little bit more amorphous, those are the ones to pay attention to. And it's like, well, why, why are we doing this here? Um, great, great, uh, illustration of this, um, going back to good old my fair lady. I love my fair lady. Um, but we talked about on the street where you live and that is a very straightforward um, form that is an introduction a a b a right and that's who freddie is isn't he like freddie is a society boy he's lived his entire life within like certain expectations and like you know he just there's not a lot of challenge to freddie you know right he's he's a simple minded young man um which is you know, no knocks on Freddie. Well, a little bit of a knock on Freddie. But, um, you know, so it, it makes sense that he would have this sort of boring, like straightforward kind of music. And you contrast that then with Henry Higgins. And Henry Higgins' music is all over the place. Like there is barely any form there. It's it's almost through composed. You look at something like um, well, Why Can't the English at the beginning of the show, but especially um, I've Grown Accustomed to Her Face, which is like, the very end of the show. And this is, this is Henry Higgins essentially feeling through his emotions in real time. And this is a man who has never really allowed himself to feel any feelings before, and he's feeling it in real time. And so you have these ridiculous sections that are like, but I shall never take her back. And then you have him being like, I've grown accustomed to her face. And they like almost no transition between them and like back and forth and just all over the place. And it's just, it's through composed for a reason, essentially. Like you're not going to give Henry Higgins in this pivotal moment in the show an A A B A song. You're not going to give him on the street where you live for him figuring out his feelings. You know, like this is Henry Higgins, who is extremely intelligent, who is extremely pompous, who always thinks that he's the smartest person in the room, who has never really allowed himself to feel these things before. And of course, it's going to be this like cacophony of sound, right? It's just going to be all over the place yeah, because totally that's disorganized. That's how his mind is working in this moment. And so it's a reflection of that character and the 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 dichotomy between Freddie and and Henry Higgins um in in that show. Like the way that their music is written. You know, you could lay them side by side for someone and who had no prior knowledge of Lerner and Lowe or musical theater or whatever. And they might not even know that they're the same composers. You know, that these are very differently written pieces of music and and yet they're in the same show and they work together in the same show because they're you know very different characters and you have to write music for the character that as it as they are it's such a good reason to dive in though like if someone's on the edge thinking oh i don't know if i really want to start learning how to do a score study i feel like this is convincing because we are talking about the acting and the character and the what you're supposed to feel after experiencing it. Like, this is so exciting. Thank you for sharing your research and your passion with us. Oh, thank you. I, you know, I, I love any opportunity to talk about musical theater. So it's my honor. 
<laughs> well, um, don't go far because you're probably going to need to come back. There's a few musicals that I want to run through with you because I'm not sure if I like them or not, but I oh. think that's going to have to be a different topic for another conversation. <laughs> <laughs> okay. well, I love that. Let's do some wrap up questions. Um, are you reading any good books right now? You know, I don't have a lot of time. <laughs> for reading you at have the moment. A toddler. I have a toddler. We checked out of the library this morning a Mo- Moana book, you know, all about oh, Moana. Yes. That's some good music. That's some <laughs> yeah, there's some good music. music in Moana. But you know, when you've seen it a hundred times, it kind of <laughs> loses its shine. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. No idea what you're talking about. <laughs> it's so funny. We're big on Moana in this house. Oh, that's so cool. Okay. My niece loves to call me on FaceTime and request Disney princess songs. And so I've had to learn a whole bunch of them because I only knew like, you know, the ones from the eighties. And so (laughs) I've been learning so many Disney princess songs, according to my sweet little niece. And it is a blast. I've not seen all of them, (laughs) but one day, one day I will see them all. You know, they're mostly good. <laughs> worth watching. I just wouldn't recommend watching them a hundred times in a row. Okay. Good to know. Well, I did watch Beating the Beast about a million times, but I remember when that came out in theaters. So there we go on that <laughs> one. Okay. So tell me, is there any organization that is inspiring you right now? Is there any music theater organizations we need to know about? Anything like that? Oh gosh. You know, I feel like I'm so out of touch these days. Um, nothing immediately springs to mind. Here here in Savannah, you know, I, I just always recommend people dive into as much of the arts as they possibly can. You know, it's there are definitely opportunities for for the arts in in the Savannah, even though it's a small, small city. Um, my husband, George, has put together a lot of really good opportunities for his his um, uh Choral group that he just put together, Musica Atlantica, just gave a concert here, at, um, and it was such such a high caliber of mu- musicianship. Those just like incredible musicians in that group, um, and I I hope I think that they will be returning next year, um, so that'll be fun to watch that organization bloom. I would love to highlight that organization too. I love what George is doing for the city of Savannah and what he's bringing to the musical world. But you're right. There's a lot of great musical things happening. You just have to take time and find it and then give time. All right. Last question. What is the one thing that really matters that you want the listener to walk away from this episode with? Oh, I would say don't be scared of the score. You know, I think that there's something to be found even for someone who has zero musical literacy, you know, there's always opportunities to learn. There's always something to be found. You just need a pair of ears, essentially. (laughs) And, you know, (laughs) and then go for it. Um, And, and, you know, it's, I think that interpretation, I don't know if we have time for this, but I, I do love to, um, I I have a little anecdote about musical interpretation um, cause it can be a scary thing, right? When you're looking at a score and you're interpreting, and I have, you know, talked quite a bit about my interpretations over the last hour of things. And they're just that they're my interpretations. And there's probably plenty of scholars who would disagree with the way I interpret things. There might be others who agree, you know, like that's the beauty of scholarship. Like everyone has their own little, um, fight to, to fight. But in terms of interpretation, I think a lot of people get stymied because they go, oh, is this what the composer intended? Am I overstepping by interpreting it this way or, you know, and, and then you sort of get paralyzed and you don't, you don't try and you don't put yourself out there and start the work because you're so worried about like, well, what did the composer intend? And unfortunately with musical theater, a lot of composers don't write about their own work or don't give interviews about their own work. There's not always a lot of information out there of like, this is exactly what I intended with this note, five note motive that I wrote here. Yeah. Um, but to that end, I, I give this example. Um, do you know the song Send in the Clowns, which is a Sondheim song. It's from uh, yes. Alone Night Music. Okay. Let's say you're singing a little uh, Send in the Clowns and you're looking at the score and you, you notice something weird about the music. The first thing you're going to notice if you're analyzing Send in the Clowns is probably that the phrases are really short and there are these huge breaks in between them. That's it's like, isn't it rich? Are we a pair? Me here at last on the ground. Do you in midair? Right. Those are really short phrases and they're really big gaps. Like, and you just sort of, it's so weird that it stands out. Right. And so that's probably the first question you ask you. Okay. Okay. I've identified this. 
why? Why why is it this way? And so maybe you come to the conclusion that like, oh, you know, she's struggling to know what to say. You know, this is a woman who has always, always known what, what to think, what to say. She's the one running the show. And in this moment, she just doesn't know. She doesn't know what to say, what to do. So she has these gaps. She's giving herself time to think. And doing that might give you this lovely like through line energy, right? That like, it's not just a gap. It's a, it's a struggle. It's, oof, what am I going to say next, right? That's great. That's awesome. Let's interpret it that way. Here's the reality though. <laughs> when A Little Night Music was first in previews, uh, Send in the Clowns was not in the show. And it was just a scene at that point in the show. And the production crew decided, you know, the artistic team decided they needed a musical moment there. Um, and they really needed to add a song to the show. But they had already cast Glynis Johns as Desiree. And Glynis Johns was a wonderful actress, but not a strong singer. And Desiree doesn't really have to sing that much in A Little Night Music. The show wasn't written for her to have to sing an 11 o'clock big emotional number. And yet, here we are having to write an 11 o'clock big emotional number for Desiree. And so what did Sondheim do? He did what he had to do to accommodate the singer, which was make the phrases short and put big gaps in between so she could breathe. <laughs> like, that's it. That's so cool. there's, no, there's no romantic answer. There's no actual... Um, creative reason why it was written the way it was written. And so the question you have to ask yourself then is, well, is my interpretation not valid then? And I would actually argue, hell no, it's still valid. <laughs> because the whole point of theater is that theater is a living art. It's not a painting which gets painted and hangs on the wall and doesn't change. Theater is constantly being reinterpreted. It's constantly being redone with new voices for new audiences. And so whatever you can find in the music, if that interpretation that you gave yourself of this is a struggle, bring something to that performance. If it helps bring a dynamic energy to your performance that wasn't there before, then I say that is a valid interpretation. We know for a fact in that case that it's not what Sondheim intended. He didn't intend for there to be any like specific meaning behind it because he had to write a song for Glynis Johns. But I think it's okay to give yourself permission to still interpret, even in those moments where it's like, I don't know what the composer intended here. I don't know if the way I'm interpreting it is correct. I would argue that in theater, as a living art, perhaps there isn't one correct answer. I think that it's it's okay to just give yourself permission to create and to interpret. I love that. I think that applies to all of us, though. Giving yourself the okay to interpret. Yeah. I love it. Oh, Carrie, this is so fun. We'll do it again. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Just go do it. Just go use your ears. I love what Carrie just said. All you need is a set of ears. Just go listen and see what you hear and then see what that does for your interpretation. And don't let that paralyze you. Just be you. You're the only you there is, my friend. So don't rob the world of that opportunity. So in case you're wondering, you matter. We all know that music matters, especially musical theater. 